Amen. We are in a series that we've entitled Joy. Joy, just the season, joy. Um, just made sense of <laughs> the topics. I, I really felt God impressed on my heart back in August. And so we've already done two weeks. I don't have time to review, but I would encourage you, if you missed one of the installments last week or the week before, please go watch it. If you were here, I'd encourage you to go watch it again because joy is such a significant topic, I believe, in our life. The enemy works so hard to keep us from it. Um, God has so many things to help us walk in it because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we need to know what the Bible says because the reality is we live in a not so very joyful world. In fact, it's just getting crazier and crazier, it seems to be. All you got to do is turn on the news and see that. We see it everywhere. You don't have to turn on the news to see that. You can go to work, go to school and see it for yourself. So we're going to talk about joy today from the standpoint of a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. It's something you have to choose. You have to make a decision and choose it. And many times when you don't feel like it, when you don't want to, let's take a look, 2 Corinthians 6. Last week we went there at the Apostle Paul. We're talking about making choices that will bring joy in your life. So he had a rough life. He, um, in fact, he had a very hard life. He wrote a lot about it in Scripture. But at the same time, he wrote more than anybody else about joy, which is always funny to me. The guy who went through maybe possibly the most stuff wrote the most about joy. In fact, most of his writings on joy were done in prison. So what a great perspective he has. Take a look at verse 10, 2 Corinthians 6, 10. Sorrowful, this is him, him writing, I'm sorrowful or I have, reason, I have reason to be sorrowful, yet I choose to rejoice. Poor, yet I choose to make others rich, having nothing, yet I choose to be as if, to act as if, think as if I have everything I need. What a great example he is for us. And really he's telling us that really joy is a choice. When you see that word yet there, it's like he's making a choice and you and I can make a choice every day. And a lot of you may not feel like that today, but I promise if you will have the guts to try what we're gonna talk about, have the guts to try what we're gonna talk about today, you'll experience greater joy in your life. Let's take a look at Isaiah. We've also looked at this passage. Isaiah 61, prophet Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene. Jesus is the fulfillment of this. But here's what the prophet Isaiah said in verse 3, 61, 3. He says, Jesus came to console, will come, and before Jesus came, obviously, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, to turn things that were bad in their life around to good, to give the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. But I want to focus on that phrase, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I would say this, submit to you today, that there is a spirit of heaviness in our earth, on our world, in our country. And I don't, you know, not a doom and gloom guy by any means, but we don't have to live that way. That's the good, right? We don't have to live there. Because God has come and make a way for you and I not to live under a spirit of heaviness. In fact, he says, Jesus came, in the New Testament, Jesus came to bring you and I a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Notice that he says that not only is it a spirit of heaviness, but the answer is there's a garment of praise. Praise will drive out the spirit of heaviness. Now, it's important for you and I to understand because not only is praise just your natural choices, but they have spiritual implications to them because the spirit of heaviness is a spirit. Now, there's some things that you can change and do better in your life, but you also have to address it spiritually. So we're going to learn some things on how to do that when we're talking about how praise operates. And really, that's what we're talking about, the garment of praise today. Now, having said that, because we are talking about praise, this is probably going to be one that's a little hard for some of us because not a lot of us are going to want to praise because praise is something that we do outwardly and openly in front of people because we all want to keep it kind of private and I'm just not that kind of guy. I'm just not that way to come from that background. Well, I want to challenge you today to open up and just to receive God's word and then make a decision. But I think it's important for us to understand that he says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now understand that the garment of praise is a garment I believe it's almost literally, you have to put it on. It's almost something tangible. It's something like this morning when you got ready, you had to put on a garment of something, right? You had in your closet or open your drawers and intentionally put something on. And I think the way this is talking about is kind of the same idea. You have to get up and put something on. It might be a perspective. It might be an attitude. I believe praise is really associated with faith. And so you may not feel it, but you wear it, an attitude or perspective. Um, it's not in you, it's on you, so to speak. And so you have to put on the garment of praise. It's a choice. You don't feel it, you put it on. And here's what we'd say. Well, I don't feel like shouting right now. 
and I don't really feel like clapping right now, and I don't feel like singing, actually. I don't even really like that song. And really, to be quite honest with you, what is a song about echo about, really? I mean, we're singing some song about echo, 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 all right? You know, we have all these lights and all this smoke. In fact, I stand on the front row sometimes, and I love the stage setup, and I can just get looking at those three lights in the middle, and if they would just spin a little bit, I think I would be hypnotized. I'm like mesmerized by them. <laughs> in fact, I think I'm going to have them start spinning a little bit, and then I'll start flashing on the screen, tithe, give, all right? <laughs> <I know. laughs> We'll just try it, see, what ha- see how it works. Okay, so <laughs> we don't filter, we don't filter it through our feelings though. We don't filter praise through our feelings. We decide I'm gonna praise no matter how I feel, no matter what's going on. And listen, it's not so, amen, but it's not so we're not talking about this so we have dynamic praise and worship services. We're talking about this so you leave different than how you come in. I mean, that's not really the point of it. We're not trying to hype everybody up and we're not trying to create this wonderful, almost like concert or whatever type moment for you and, and we go out. We're, we want you to be changed. We want you to be transformed by the presence of God through your praise. We want you to be different than how you come in. In fact, when you look at Isaiah 61, 3, it says, no, uh, and they can, they've moved on, but notice that it said, put on the garment of praise. It did not say put on the garment of worship. It didn't. In fact, nowhere in Scripture Will you see, put on the garment of worship. However, worship is extremely important to you and I. Worship is important. It's, imp- it's an important part of our Christian life. It's an expression of our love to God. And a lot of what we do is worship. A- and it's important for us to understand that. But, but I want you to understand something. I think there's, obviously, and we're going to draw the difference between worship and praise, because I think there's a trend, and I think over time, and we tend, I tend, I think we tend to gra- we kind of gravitate more towards worship because it is a bit more private and personal. But I think in doing that, we're robbing ourselves of the blessing of praise. We're robbing God from our expression of praise. And I almost would say it this way. I almost think it's a strategy of the enemy to get you and I more into worship that we miss praise because praise is what drives out the spirit of heaviness. The Bible doesn't say put on the garment of worship, although worship is important. So have you ever wondered in coming in today and maybe for your first time, have you ever wondered why we start off with fast songs and then we go to slow songs? I mean, just why do we do that? One fast or two fast, one or two slow, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, so can I just tell you, it's not to give everybody time to get into their seats, <laughs> right? I mean, it sounds funny, but it's not. We're going to start with some praise songs just to give everybody. Not everybody's here yet. They're, they're getting their coffee. They're getting settled and checking their kids in. And then, and then they'll all be in their seat by the time we get to worship. And it's not for that. And can I tell you, I, I hope after today's message, that if we're one that kind of just wanders in a little bit that way, we're getting coffee, can I tell you, you'll want to, when we're done today, you'll want to leave home early so you're in here when praise starts because you won't want to miss the time of praise. So we don't do it for any other reason than the Bible says to do it that way. It literally says to do it that way. The Bible says enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. That's how you come in. It's important. It's not just to give people a time to settle down before we get into worship. So we start off with this excitement, with this joy, and then it turns to a place where it's a little bit more introspective. Let's take a look in Psalms 95, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Listen to what he's saying. Come to him this way. Come into his presence this way. And then you go to verse 6, just a few scriptures later. And then he says, now come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before God, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Do you see the progression there? He talks about how, and Psalms is the biggest book in the, in the Bible. It's, isn't it interesting that, the, that, that Psalms talks a lot about praise? It says something to you. The biggest book in the Bible has more to say about praise than any other place. It says 150 chapters. And so here we see a progression, how we enter him and then we transition into a more introspective moment. And honestly, I think people have become more comfortable with worship than with our praise. Because worship can be personal and and, and a bit more reserved, but praise requires something different from you. And I think we get more comfortable with our, uh, our, our praise, I mean our worship rather, and we miss the power of praise. And again, if we're not careful, we will miss the benefit of it, therefore. And so we praise God for his mighty works. And really, honestly, praise is not about me at all. It's about God and his mighty works. And we praise God for what he's done. And so we, we come in the room and we sing songs about how awesome God is, even when we don't feel he's awesome right now. 
And I think praise has a lot to do with faith, to be honest with you. And so we praise God for what he has done, and we worship God for who he is. But I think this, I think sometimes when we come in to praise, it's important for us to praise even when we don't feel like it. And really, praise is about God, not as much to God. And really, praise is, is, really, is really so you'll hear and so everybody around you will hear. Because honestly, we don't always come in super excited about praising God. We don't really feel about it. But if people around about us are praising God, it gets a little contagious. Okay, well, yeah, you know, yeah, okay, man, that's, yeah. And he's real excited, yeah. Kind of gets on you like at a ball game. Well, you don't want to stand and cheer at one point in time and all of a sudden everybody else is and you feel that. But let me say it this way, praise is horizontal. Praise is not really even singing to God. I'm singing about God to you and to me. And really I'm singing about God to the devil, to be honest with you, and he needs to hear it. And, and what happens sometimes is that we don't feel it, but the people beside us feel it, and then it kind of rubs off on us. Or maybe we're the one that feels it, and they don't, and it kind of rubs off on them. But listen, it's important, and let me say it this way, it's important to be in the room. I thank God for technology, and for those who couldn't be here on Sundays, and when you can't, and joining us maybe around the world, you don't have, but when any time you can get in the room, it's important to experience the dynamic of praise. We need that and we need each other in that moment. And it's part of our Sunday experience. It's not just you and God, it's you and us. It's together. And I can worship without you, but I don't think I can really effectively praise God without you. Because praising God without you is like, have you ever, have you pictured this? And I tried, to, I tried to create a moment where I could film this. At the, I was gonna go to Unicorn Stadium and, and sit in the grandstands, just me and have somebody film and act like there's a game going on. It's like this, coming to, to praise God by yourself is almost like when your team scores a touchdown and you're the only one, just you're sitting down and saying, yes, yes, and you're looking to high five somebody. It's like, yeah, awesome. And then next time they score, it's like, yeah, 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 it's good, good job. And, and the next time it's like, oh, okay, you're on your phone and next time you're, you're seated, the next time you're laying down, right? It's like, so we need each other in these moments. The Bible talks a lot about praise and, and, and how it's horizontal, it's to each other and how that inspires and encourages each other and praise without each other is almost like being in the stands and the only one there when your team scores. And worship is vertical, is up and down. Let me give you one more thought. Worship is a response to God's love. Praise is a choice. You can praise God and not feel anything about God. You can praise God and be mad at God. You ever try and worship him and be mad at him? <laughs> You can praise God and it'd be the last thing that you want. I don't even want to do that. I'm mad at God and I'm just, but if you start praising him, everything changes. Praise is not something you naturally do. It's probably not our first choice and usually it's kind of down on the list, but you choose to do it. It's a choice. Praise is a choice. If you can put on the garment of praise, then that spirit of heaviness in our lives and our emotions and our marriage and our family is going to go, the Bible says. So praise focuses on God, not me. Praise gets my focus on God, not me, and what's happening in my life right now. It's not about me at all. We live in a world, a, a, a selfie society where we're so trained to have everything about us, but praise gets our eyes off of us. There's more joy when we get our eyes off of us and on Him. So, and we can, talk about, we can talk about how hard our day is all day. We can talk about how tough our life is. We can talk about how, how hard we have it. And we can come into a place and talk about how great our God is. And sing that to him. Psalms 50, 23 says this. Those who sacrifice, thank offerings, honor me. It's a sacrifice of praise. It means it's not what you want to do, but the Bible says that if you'll offer what you don't want to do, he likes it. If you'll do something you don't want to do, you're not even feeling it, it honors him. And he likes it. And I think that's reason enough then. If God likes it, that's reason enough. It doesn't matter how I feel. It's a sacrifice, I think. Uh, and I, was, <laughs> I was thinking about this. I know we had Wednesday night at my uh, small group, my life group, prayer group, uh, my mom uh, comes and attends. And we got on this topic of old school songs. And, and so we're just talking about songs back in the day, right? We're singing some songs back in the day. And of course, when you talk about Garment of Praise, help me out, everybody, if you know this song. And, and uh, back in the day, we used to try, actually, I tried to get my mom to come play it, but she, she wouldn't. And so I, I've, I've forgiven her since then. But um, I love you, mom. And uh, so... <laughs> So, Mom, you can help me out with this one at least. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, put on the garment of praise. I'm going to start preaching to this section right over here. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Kathy. They don't know. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Come on, you know the song. You just don't want to sing it. That's okay. Um, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. Right? We used to sing songs like that. Um, 
How about this one? We bring a sacrifice of praise. All right, there you go. Come on, there you go. There's all the people that love Jesus. I wonder where you were, what happened to you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but those songs just really are the word, the word of God, and they're real. And because I think it's important because praise reminds me of the eternal, not the temporary. Not just what's happening around here. In fact, when I, when I praise God, I'll often, when I bring a sacrifice of praise, I'll often declare something about something that's not even true. Things may be terrible in my life, but I may declare something about God about my life that's not even happening right now. It's not even true right now, but that's the expression of faith. I see things that be not as though they are, and so I'll declare them about God and, and what he's doing in my life, even though I don't see it that way. God is great, and I'm victorious, and I'm more than a conqueror. No, you're not. You're having a horrible week, and the devil's beating you down. Right? You're fighting with your wife. Things at work are going bad, and you're mad at your kids. And right now, probably some of us will want to say, and right now I'm thinking about leaving early, and I'm going to step on the toe of every person in my role on my way out, right? <laughs> Stomp on them. But I'll open my mouth and sing God of praise. I don't want to. But if I lift a sacrifice of praise, the Bible says the spirit of heaviness will be lifted. That's what the Bible says. So I'm going to speak more to not where I am, but to where I'm going. See, Paul gives us a secret in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. Here's what he says. He says, well, I'm hard pressed on every side. I can't find a relief anywhere. Everywhere I turn, it's like I'm, everything's pressing in, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. He goes on to say this in 17. For our light, listen to the wording, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Verse 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen or what is happening, but on what is unseen, since what is, un what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I'm looking at where I'm going, not what's necessary. So I can praise him based on that, regardless of what's happening right here and now. So it's a sacrifice at times. We have to bring that. So I'm going to speak not to where I am, but to where I'm going. The key, in other words, Paul says here in 2 Corinthians, is the then the then is greater than the now. The seen things are temporary. The unseen is eternal. See, praise is faith-filled. And it's going to work because our God is faithful. And our God is mighty. And our God is strong. Amen? So praise is outward, not inward. It's expressive. And that's where we struggle because praise is outward. It's expressive. You remember the song? Help me with this one. Everybody should know this one. Help me with this one. I'm Hopefully. Uh, I've got the joy, 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 joy. Where? Yeah. Well, you know what? Get it out of your heart. My goodness. Get it in your hands. Get it in your feet. Get it in your mouth. Get it in your face. Get it in your actions. Like, my faith is private. My, my walk with the Lord is private. Really? Because that's not scriptural. And he said, get out of your heart and get out in your hands and your actions and your, your face. And that no matter how you feel, it doesn't matter how you feel. Hebrews 13, 15 says this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. You're not going to want to do it, but do it. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. But you got to open your mouth and do it. Get it out of your heart and get it in your mouth. And do it. That's, honestly, most of the time, the last thing you'll want to do is praise, but it'll bring you joy. The sacrifice of praise, the Bible describes it as a sacrifice, but it's there you'll find joy when you openly profess. And now I know many of you didn't come from a church like this. In fact, walking to a church like this was probably a first for many of you. And probably a lot of you decided not to come back for a while or whatever. It's like, I just don't know. I remember when I was a kid, my dad, and my dad, you've heard the story, my dad would drop my mom and my brother and sister and I off at the Baptist church, Pierre Moran Baptist church every Sunday. And I have no idea where he went, and he'd just come pick us up when church was over. And then one day, he got radically rededicated. He got saved as a kid, and then he made, made a battle, battlefield prayer promise to God in Vietnam. And, and then a, one day, just a radical rededication. And we went from the Baptist church to the crazy church <laughs> down. Right? So, and, and I hope that, we still love them. I hope they don't go online and listen to me preach. But anyway, so... It was like, what in the world? And I was like in sixth grade, and my brother's in eighth grade, and we... I thought our dad had just lost his mind. Are you kidding me? We went from the Baptist to all the holy rolled in. The, and and, and, and do you, you ever seen the joy bucket? It's a bucket with joy on it on the outside. And they just go like this and they shout and celebrate and all that kind of. We've seen it all, can I tell you? And we thought my dad had lost his mind. 
And so we went week after week because my dad, but it, we saw it change my dad. And my dad was all in. He was an all in guy. He just didn't go halfway. He was an all in. This is what I'm doing, Lord. I'm all in. And so after a while, and we started seeing it, we started hearing about it. And after a while, it wasn't so crazy. Like, yeah, I want some of that. No, some of that. No, I don't want that. Get the joy bucket out of here, but I want, you know, I'll take that right there. And you know what happened was we started seeing what people were experiencing, and then we saw see, seeing it in the Bible. And that's all we want. We don't want to conform anybody to our expression of worship. We want everybody to see how God wants to be praised, how he wants to be worshiped. And so isn't it important for you and I to praise God how he wants to be praised, not how we want to praise him? Isn't it important for us to love God how he wants to be loved, not how we want to love him? Serve him how he wants to be served. It's that way in life, right? And, and you know that, especially if you're married. You love your spouse the way they receive love, not the way you give love. You love God, you should love God the way he receives love, not the way you want to give it. You should praise him the way he wants to be praised, not how you want to praise him. And so I know that this is a different expression for some people when they came into this church for the, for the first time to, to experience it. And, and, and I know you came in and saw hands being raised up. How many of you came from a hand-raising church? Okay, a few of you. There's really no point in me asking the others who didn't come from a hand-raising church because you're not going to raise your hand anyways. Okay. Just kidding. You're not going to raise your hand. Okay, how many of you, how many of you came from a, a church that did not raise hands? Look, more, more, if you notice, more than the first. Same in first service. More people came that. But you know what's in the Bible? And I'm not knocking any other church, or don't, don't hear me in that. I'm just talking, we're not trying to get you conformed to our way. We're trying to get you to see what the Word says about it. But understand that there's no expectations for a certain way of worshiping God other than the way God describes it in Scripture. Amen? And so there's so much freedom and joy in worshiping Him the way He wants it, the way He likes it. So I just want to encourage you as we, we finish out this lesson today, take a step and go after God. Now understand this, when you do especially in the form of praise or something outwardly expressed. When you do know this, all hell's gonna come against you. Some of you, when you started it for the first time and you didn't come from a hand-raising church or anything like that, you started coming here and started bringing your family and friends, you know that not only did hell come against you, but <laughs> your family and friends did. The earth, half the earth will come against you too. But this is why, because the enemy wants you not to have the joy of the Lord, because it is your strength. He wants you to stay oppressed with the spirit of heaviness. And so I know this, and coming here to Tree Life, and you tell people, and you probably heard this, I hear it all the time, we're known as a hand-raising church. Absolutely we are. I have no problem with that. We're known as a, in fact, we've been called that happy church, right? You ever heard that happy, you guys have a happy church over there? I'm like, what's the alternative? I mean, where, do you go to the unhappy church? Is that where you want to go? I mean, it's like, I mean, shouldn't every church be happy? But anyway, so, uh, so but understand, this was a problem even in, in Jesus' day. Even when Jesus was on the planet, same thing, religious crowd against this outward expression of praise. And so let's take a look at a passage where, where Jesus confronts it. And, and understand, all we're trying to do is get more joy in your life. And so let's take a look here in Luke 19, 37 through 40. This is Palm Sunday. This is where the, when Jesus is entering Jerusalem a, a week before his uh, crucifixion and resurrection, um, that they greeted him at the gates with palm leaves and victory. So that's where we get Palm Sunday. So Jesus is coming in Jerusalem, and right at the crest where Mount of Olives begins its descent, the whole crowd of disciples, listen to this, burst into enthusiastic praise over all, over what? All the mighty works, all the people that were raised from the dead, all the healings, all the eyes being opened, all the ears being opened, how awesome God is, how powerful God is, all the things they've witnessed. Verse 38, blessed is he who, blessed is he who comes, the king in God's name, All's well in heaven, glory in the high places. But look at verse 39. Some of the religious crowd, the Pharisees, from the crowd told him, Teacher, Jesus, you need to get your people under control. You need to get that church under control. You need to get that congregation under control there. But he said to them, If they keep quiet, the stones will do it for them, shouting praise. Because that's how I receive it. He says, Because that's what I, the stones will do it because that's what I like. Even Jesus faced that in his day. But sometimes it's hard because it's, we know it's outwardly expressed, and so there's a, sometimes we feel like we just we don't want to go there. We don't want to do that. But know this, it's a choice. Praise is a choice despite the circumstances. And so it says, put on the garment of praise. And so I, I'm just trying to think, oh, how can I illustrate? I really want you to get this. So how do I illustrate that? And, and I really think, and I, I see it in terms like this, this tangible choice that you make every day or throughout the day that you have to put it on. It'd be like this. Let me give you an example. It'd be like this. Put it on a garment. 
It'd be like this. You gotta pick something out and you gotta put it on. I'm gonna pick this out today. I'm gonna put this on today. Well, I hear a little praise. And I hear a few haters out there too, Lord. It's like, like the religious crowd. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's the point though. I'm gonna keep my glasses off because I can't see your faces. That might be a good thing. I don't know if you're liking it or not. You're falling asleep. Put on the, you just come in like there's a game today or whatever. You put, you've been there. When there's a game and you're gonna go someplace, you put on the appropriate garments. And it's just like, you'll shout and you'll cheer and you'll support and you'll be a productive part or a positive part of what's going on in it. Obviously the Cowboys, I like the Cowboys, but there's not a whole lot to praise about right now with the Cowboys, I'm just telling you. So it's in faith, Lord. It's in faith today in Jesus' name. So, so the point is, this is a garment I put on and it changes things a little bit in me. Changes the perspective a little bit, changes things in me. Okay, let's get this off. <laughs> Thank you, who's ever clapped. I can't see who's ever clapping, so it's okay. I'm still gonna pray for you. Whoever's clapping can't see you. What about, what about this garment? What, what about this garment right here? Got a little more serious all of a sudden, right? What's this garment? Hold on. Mom, I heard that laugh, Mom. I don't have to see you. I heard your laugh, Mom. I, I mean, funny, but not funny, right? I mean, this is obviously a gown, but... But here's a garment that, that people wear when they're hurt. That people will wear this when they're maybe sad. Maybe, maybe, maybe something's happened in their life and, and maybe there's really pain there. Maybe there's some real pain there. And we're not denying the pain or the reality of what's happening in your life. But we are, what we are asking you is to praise a higher power. And despite what's happening, to go beyond that. Because what we do is we'll put on our garment and we'll, we'll, we'll sit down on our pain and we'll sit down on our despair and we'll sit down on our depression. And if we're not careful, every day we'll keep putting that same garment on. And all of a sudden that hurt becomes a garment that we wear. And some of us have been carrying those pains for years. All we need to do is change garments. We just need to change it. And, and this is the point here. So we put, on a, we put on a different garment. It's not like I need to fast and pray. It's not like I got to go to church and have the pastor lay hands on me. It's not like I, it's not, you just change garments. And so some of us have been wearing this garment of hurt for a long time, unfortunately. Like, oh no, let me, yeah. Let's <laughs> kidding. Just kidding. What about, what about this garment right here? What about this one? Here's a garment for you, right? It, it didn't go so well first service, I'm just warning you. We'll see. Put this garment on. Because honestly, our choices, last week we talked about our choices. Our choices are putting on different garments. And uh, some of us have made choices in our life that has brought guilt and shame and have imprisoned us. Yeah, that's about the way first service went. I like that. Yeah, yeah that's not very, okay, yeah. yeah. That's that. That extra taco I ate, I think I can't get it, I can't get it on there. But, okay, well, but here's the thing, here's the thing, all joking aside, really. Some of us have been imprisoned by our choices. And some of us have been in bondage from guilt and shame for years. And we're carrying around this guilt. We can't, we can't get our joy because you can't be guilty and happy at the same time. And we've allowed the enemy to bring shame, which Jesus already died and paid for guilt and shame for our life. The enemy keeps bringing that back, and we're putting on this garment of prison, prison garment. And we're, we're imprisoned in this place. But to understand something, when Paul and Silas found themselves in prison, the Bible says they began to praise God, and their chains fell off of them. And opened the doors opened up and escaped. Orange, you glad I'm not wearing this anymore? Orange. I got the joy, 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 joy. Yeah. Okay. What about this garment? This one right here. See, because you choose every day. Put on the garment. You choose every day. This garment right here. You know what this is? It's a choir robe. It's a garment of praise right here. You choose to put it on. So... You choose. What, what am I going to wear today, God? If we go by what we feel, we won't be putting this on. Because the enemy's going to make sure we're wearing this garment or we're wearing this garment. Well, maybe not that one. But anyways, we're not. <laughs> Put on the garment of praise, the Bible says, for the spirit of heaviness. 
So change your garment. If you're here today and you've been imprisoned by guilt and shame, then take off the prison clothes and put on the garment of praise. If you've been living in your hurt and your pain, then take off the gown and put on the garment of praise. That's all you have to do. Can I say right now, I may feel, if I have this on, I may feel like this or I may feel like that, but when I take that step of faith, and in faith, I start praising God for who he is. And, and it doesn't matter then anymore. And all of a sudden, it's changed because the Bible says that my spirit of heaviness will leave, will go. And some of us have been living way too long right here. And we need to just change our garment. Take this off. No, wait. There we go. Okay. The zipper got stuck first service, and I had to wear it the rest of the day. But that's all right. That's all right. My hope is that that point makes sense to you. And you might think it's that simple. God made it that simple. He gives us the ability to choose. We can't control the circumstances that happen around us sometimes, but we can control our response to it. And so the Bible says every day you choose what you're going to put on. You may not feel like it, but you choose it anyways. And so we come in, we offer him praise. We put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You know, here's... Hey, if you'll do it, you got to start somewhere. If you'll do it more and more, and you'll do it consistently, that awkwardness and uncomfortableness that you initially felt will go, because then you'll actually be doing what God created you to do. And so what you'll see happen is, over time, this will happen. This won't even be in my closet anymore. This won't even be a choice for me to wear anymore. And this one, well, we'll leave it on the rack. That's... But you get the picture? So what does that look like then, the garment of praise? I, I want to give you a couple of things, and I know we're over time. Please give me some extra time. We had that wonderful child dedication moment. I never want to shorten that one or rush through that one. So give me just a few more minutes because I need to let you know what does this look like? What does the garment of praise look like? Because that's all well and good, but what does that mean? And let me give you just a really quick um, lesson. The Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament was written in Hebrew. New Testament was written in Greek. I know we read the English. Understand it never happened in England and it didn't have to happen in America. But So we have where it happened in the Middle East with the Hebrew language and the Greek language. They use so many more words for one word than we do. In fact, the Greek language has four more words for every American word, if you will. Four times as many words as English words. Uh, let me give you an example. If you take the word love, we have one word, love. In the Greek, there's different words for it. One might be agape. Agape is the unconditional love of the Father. Another word for love, we call it love. In the Greek, it might be eros, which would be erotic. And we have, we have an understanding of what that is. Another thing we call love in the Greek, they'll call it phileo, which is like a brother. I love my brother. That's just a brotherly love. Well, when you go into the Hebrew then in the Old Testament, they have many more words. The problem is we just have one word. So when we think of the word praise, we don't really understand what we're talking about. So in the Old Testament, in Psalms, which is the biggest book in the Bible, which has more to say about praise than any other book, we find this word seven different ways. The, Hebrews, the Hebrew word, uh, the one word we have praise in English, seven different Hebrew words. Let me give you those real quick. They all talk about the way God wants to be praised. Let me give it to you real quick. Number one, hallel, hallel, means to rave, boast, celebrate, to clamor foolishly. It's where we get the word hallelujah. In fact, hallelujah means yah on the end of that word means God. So it means literally to hallel God or to rave, boast, celebrate, to clamor foolishly about God. It kind of sounds like Friday night in Texas or Saturday in Texas, doesn't it, right? Friday or Saturday night, maybe Sunday afternoon. We will sit in traffic for hours, drive hours, be in a stadium for hours, drive home hours on Friday or Saturday. But why won't we do that on Sunday morning? To basically to hallel. When God's done so much more for us than any football team, if you will, ever did or ever could. So we hallel God. Psalms 35, 18, here's what it says, New Living Translation. Then I will thank you in front of the great assembly. I will hallel you, celebrate you, clamor foolishly before all the people. You need to get those people in control. Oh no, we're gonna hallel today. We're gonna celebrate God in front of the great assembly. Notice that it is 
I don't keep it to myself. It's in front of people, it's public. Number two, yada, yada, to acknowledge in public. Well, I got God down in my heart. My faith is private. It'd be like, I thought about this, it'd be like me, my, my, for God, my, my faith is private. It'd be like me, my love for my, my wife is private. I, it'd be like going every, I take my wedding ring off when I leave the house. I'm leaving the house, I take my wedding ring off, I, I put it on the table out in front of the door, and then I go for my day, and I come back home, and I pick my wedding ring up. I say to my wife, hey, I was out for the day, I took my wedding ring off so nobody would know that we're married, but now at home I love you. Can I tell you that would happen one time? <laughs> one time. And then my wife would make it where I could never take this off again. In fact, I'd probably be go for my wedding ring to a nose ring, would be my guess, knowing my wife. But why do we do that with God? And really, and honestly, why, why, why? Honestly, I think our conservative view of this, our keep it to ourself view of this, might offend God. It just might. Because Jesus says, if you won't acknowledge me in front of people, I can't acknowledge you before my Father. Psalms 138.1 says this, I will... I forgot, I forgot the word. I'm sorry. I will, oh yeah, I will yada you. What is it? Where do we go? Okay, I will yada you, Lord, with all my heart. With all my heart, I will acknowledge you in public. With all my heart, God. Okay, number three, we got to keep going. Here's the word. We have the word praise in the Hebrew. It's the word barak. And it means to bless by kneeling or bowing. Now, it doesn't just mean physically. It means a posture or an attitude or presenting yourself. When you barak, you present yourself to God, expecting to receive something from him you don't currently have. It's an attitude of, wow, God, you're such a generous God. Psalms 103.1 says this, Barak the Lord, present yourself to the Lord, my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. I will. Barack, you, Lord, I will present myself to you, expecting something from our great and generous God. I will position myself to receive something I don't currently have. I mean, what would it be like if we came in here every Sunday with that attitude, that, and we, we were like this, I will Barack you, we will, we will Barack you. That's all I got, I mean, we will, we will Barack, okay, that yeah, was strange. Hey, how come you're singing that song and not the other ones? I don't know. The, okay. What if we come that way with that posture? Number four, Zamar. Zamar. Making music to God with strings. How come you got all those instruments up there? Because it's in the Bible. How come you have all those guitars and drums and why you do it? Because it's in the Bible. Psalms 92.1. It is good to praise the Lord and make music. It is good. It, it is good. The, the word Zamar. It is good to Zamar. Got to make music with strings and other things. Oh, most high God. He likes it. He likes it. Now look at Psalms 150, the last psalm in Psalms, the last psalm, three through five. Here's what he says. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Man, that's so loud. Why you got all that music? Can I tell you, if this is too loud for you, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. Heaven said, the Bible says the sound of heaven is like a continuous roar of rushing water. It says it's like a clash of thunder. That's what it says it's like in heaven. And all the lights and everything. Hey, that's all in the Bible. Okay, number five, Shabak. Shabak, to address and a loud tone, to shout. Now, that's why when your team scores, you just don't sit there. You jump and you shout. That's why when you see somebody you haven't seen in a long time, man, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad you're home. I, I, I'm so excited. You, you jump and you shout. You shabak them. But why is it normal every other place and it can't be normal before our God? Psalm 63, 3 through 4 says this. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will shabak you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will shout, I will address you in a loud tone. He likes it. Number six, toda, toda, means to lift hands in adoration. What about that hand raising thing that y'all do? That's a hand raising church. To lift hands in adoration, what's up with that? Toda? Psalms 50, 23, here's what it says. Whoever offers toda glorifies me. You know why we raise our hands? Because he likes it. He likes to be glorified. Whoever offers toda glorifies me, raises their hands, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. He likes it when we lift our hands to glorify him. And can I just tell you that if he likes it, that's reason enough for me. 
Let me give you number seven, the last one, and it is the word. We, our word is praise. Hebrew word is tequila. No, I did not say tequila. And some of you are like, I just found my life verse. What is it right there? And it means exuberant singing. I guess it kind of gives you the same result. I don't know from personal experience, but. Psalms, hey, if you think that's funny, Psalms 34, 1. Here's what it says. I will extol the Lord at all times. His tequila will always be on my lips. <laughs> you know, this doesn't sound so bad. We're just laughing, having a good time. Like, I'm, all of a sudden, my brain's like, na 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 na. How do you all know that song? <laughs> the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. God likes exuberant singing. God likes exuberant singing. But I know it can be hard for some of us. But please, please, please listen. All joking aside and everything, we've had a great time, and I hope that you've received this this morning. This is the word of God. We're not trying to get you to conform you to our expectations. We're trying to get you to praise God the way he wants to be praised. God likes clapping, singing, shouting, dancing, hands raised. He likes to be praised. And guess what? Putting on the garment of praise drives away the spirit of heaviness. Maybe that's why he likes it so much. Maybe he doesn't want his kids to walk around in heaviness. And he knows he created a way. If you'll just put on that garment, especially when you don't feel like it, then that spirit of heaviness will lift, and he loves it when you're not weighed down by heaviness. Maybe that's why he likes it so much. And the truth is, so will you. If you can put all that religious stuff, maybe some pride, maybe some guilt, some shame, put it all away, it's what you were created to do. We do it everywhere else. If you're looking for permission to do it in church, I didn't go to church like that. If you're looking for permission to do it in church, you have it this morning. In fact, let's just go a higher level than me. You have written permission. It's in the Bible that God wrote. And God's trying to add some life to you, some joy to you, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. But you have to make a choice every day. And it is a sacrifice. It's not going to be easy. The only part of life that we can control is our reaction to it. See, you can't control the weather, you can't control the economy, your employer, you can't control your, your body at times, your health, you can't control your family, your spouse, you can't control some things sometimes. But you can control your response to those things. And that's why we choose. We choose it. So that's why we choose to take all the other options off the table, off the rack, out of the closet, and just leave the one. You have to put on the garment of praise. I want to do one thing before we pray for people to give their life to Jesus. I really, I really felt I was, the Lord was leading me to say, I just want to pray for just a spirit of heaviness to leave. I just want to rebuke and take authority over a spirit of heaviness. So let's do that. Every, this is about our heads. This is kind of attitude of prayer. Father, I just write now in Jesus' name, we just rebuke a spirit of heaviness, Father God. We know it's a spirit, Father God, so we take authority over that spirit right now in Jesus' name. Through the authority we have because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we take authority over the spirit of heaviness and we say, you're not welcome here. You're not welcome in these lives. You're not welcome in these families. You're not welcome in these bodies, these minds, these marriages. You are not welcome. You must leave in Jesus' name. We take authority over you, spirit of depression. We take authority over guilt and shame. We take authority over sadness and despair. We take authority over those things. And we choose to put on the garment of praise and lay those other things at your feet, Father God. For we will not be weighed down by a spirit of heaviness because you're a good God and you're a mighty God. And we trust you, Father God. So we will pray praise you and we will lift our voice especially when we don't feel about it in Jesus mighty name amen thank you Jesus thank you Jesus amen